You never know if it could change your life. Take a chance, you need a wrong or right. You never know if you're wrong and dice. You better roll and dice. Welcome to Best of Year 3, Dungeon Master of None. Here's our interview with Andy about running D&D and role-playing games for kids. I think there might be mm, uh, a tendency or an idea that, oh, if I'm going to run for kids, the characters that they play need to be kids themselves or something like that. Well, that's, that's crazy. That's, true? that's crazy. That's true? No, that is definitely not true. I mean, the whole reason that we play role-playing games as adults is to be something other than what we are. So why would that be any different for kids? Uh, I think kids more so than adults hunger to uh, experience the world as something other than relatively uh, impotent and uh, you know, small participants. They want to have power. They want to have authority. They they want to have uh, the ability to go and do uh, in a world where kids are often very limited. And I think uh, I think kids that I have played with have been much more responsive to games where they either aren't playing kids or are playing kids with an extended sense of what they can and cannot do in the world. I so, think you're absolutely right. I never, like, in the, the first session playing with middle schoolers, they were all, like, uh, you know, you know that moment when you're DMing where you've really, like, you realize you've stepped back from the game and you haven't actually said anything for 15 minutes or something, but you don't need to because everyone is having a blast happened when students had the power of uh, oh they had discovered an e you know a sh the local shopkeep was an evil spy and that you know they were in charge with charged with dealing with persons like this and they had to decide whether to you know turn this person in or do something else with them or let them go and that sort of authority right which is not something my middle school students <laughs> ever really have was um, intoxicating and here's our MST3K style riff on the just awful Dungeons and Dragons movie played live. Very average CGI. Budget of the film was $45 million. And I love that we've had this debate before. Should dragons be bats and their four legs wings or they should, should they be cats and have separate wings? I love how they found an they, unhappy they, 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 medium. They split the difference. And, and it's terrible. It's awful. That dragon's really swole, too. It's a super jacked <laughs> dragon, yeah. Look at those shoulders. This right here is about the coolest thing that anybody does with magic in the entire movie. I, yeah. it's The rest of it's just... Uh, very uh, Return of the Jedi. Yeah. They rancored our boy. They did. And this, this, I, this I don't get at all. The, the emphasis on the CGI blood, which... Sure, you've got to CGI the dragon, but can't you just, like, I don't know. It, it just looks so bad. And they spend so much time, like, <laughs> like, look, we're like right up on the fucking awful CGI blood. Notice that everything's pouring in perfect little waterfalls from one or two points of the blood. Of course. And now we have Cleveland. That's. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's I was, the Kaya, I was, Cuyahoga I was thinking River about Cleveland of Sumdal. Uh, here's our fucking heroes. Our heroes. And here's our interview with game designer Olivia Hill. It's been my goal in life to have something named after me, like a Burnside or a Captain Blazer, but you have already accomplished this goal with, on page 27, the Olivia Hill rule. What is the <laughs> Olivia Hill rule, and why should we all use it? Because we should. <laughs> so, the Olivia, actually, I've got the book in front of me, so I'm going to give the exact text. Um, yeah. Okay, so the Olivia Hill rule is, if you're a fascist, you're not welcome to play this game. It's against the rules. If you're reading this and thinking, you just call everyone who you disagree with a fascist, then you're probably a fascist, or you're incapable of drawing <laughs> inference from context and acknowledging a dangerous political climate that causes the oppressed to be so hyperbolic. 
Don't play this game. Heal yourself. Grow. Learn. Watch some Mr. Rogers Neighborhood or something. <laughs> it's a good rule. Every book should have this rule. Fuck yeah. So, yeah, since then, we've had about, like, nine other games who have picked it up and, as the Olivia Hill rule. And so far, it's it's kind of funny because... Like, I think that there's a weird misconception about what it means. I've, just, I've heard some snickering amongst, like, liberal types about it. And they're like, I can imagine a fascist picking up this game, reading it, and wanting to play, and then being like, but I'm a fascist, so I'm not going to. That's not what it does. Like, it's not something that people are going to take to their table and be like, okay, Tom, are you a fascist? Because if you are, you can't play this game. Like, that's never going to happen. What it's going to do is make them feel unwelcome. It's in the free preview for a reason. They see this, they get angry, they go and yell to all of their friends on 4chan on it, and then all of their friends on 4chan either buy it secretly and pretend that they're not reading it and liking it too, or they're just staying the fuck away from it, which is what I want. Um, you know, this is how this is how we did it in the 80s at punk shows. When Nazis would show up at punk shows, we would tell them, get the fuck away. You know, Jello Biafra, Nazi punks, fuck off. You you have to make it abundantly clear that these people aren't welcome. And when you do, they, they do lash out a little bit. They get pissed, but they leave because they realize you're not going to tolerate the bullshit. And it works. Right. If you don't do this, suddenly you've discovered that six months later, your bar has become a Nazi bar or your RPG space has become a Nazi space. Yep. So, yeah, you got to do it. Yeah, you got to do it. And here's a clip of Rob and I's bizarre and excellent trip back in time to 1984 to the archives of Dragon Magazine for Dungeons and Demography. If you have uh, no clue uh, just how deep this particular rabbit hole can go. And so I'm going to cast us back again. This is before Matt and I were born. Uh, this is uh, this is uh, ages ago, uh, and I want you to know what people were thinking about when they were creating and building their uh, advanced Dungeons and Dragons worlds. So, um, I looked up Stephen Innes. I don't actually know who he is. I couldn't figure it out. I don't know what his contributions to D and D are, but uh, let's let's see what he has to say about the effects of population growth and regrowth. <clears throat> okay, all right. I was I I would have never guessed this. Hit me with it. <laughs> Uh, an advanced Dungeons & Dragons registered trademark game world is usually one of action and a tumult. Humanoid armies meet human and demi-human forces regularly in mortal combat. Well, God, countries... I mean, gosh, this sounds so exciting. <laughs> countries are invaded and their inhabitants are killed or driven off. Magical or nagical, natural disasters lay waste to large areas at least once every millennium. Okay. Monsters hunt travelers in the wilderness and, in turn, are hunted by other monsters or by adventurers. True, there are safe places in the world, but they are usually preserved by force of arms and magic or because they are isolated and perhaps occupy an undesirable position, such as in the middle of a swamp. You know, I, I'm, I'm with you. I'm with you so far. Like, I mean, the, one of the great things of D&D is uh, <laughs> humans and humanoids are not at the top of the food chain. That's right. Okay. Many of these backwaters are poor lands, where starvation is enemy enough. Immortality is only for the gods, and not even for all of them. This is as it should be, Matt, uh, for an exciting campaign. <laughs> <laughs> Adventurers are naturally found with trouble and change. There is, however, the question of replacement. Where do the hordes of humanoids come from? Those that spring up to kill and be killed time and time again. How do the humans and demi-humans make up their inevitable losses? How do what goblins the... just keep coming out of the woodworks? Why do, how do humans, sorry, what of the other inhabitants of the world, from brownies and beholders to wyverns and wards? Uh, presumably their populations grow in the same way that populations do in the real world, unless they are somehow spontaneously generated by the natural and supernatural forces that surround them. This has some interesting corollaries. Okay, okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to try and guess where he gets this corollary from. Uh, I'm going to say, because he's a nerd, he's going to talk about population after the Black Death solely in Europe? Next? We'll, we'll see. We'll okay, see. Okay, okay. I mean, is he going to bring up... I, I'm really curious. Is he going to bring up how the ecosystem of the Underdarks fucking sustains itself? We, we, bear with me, Matt. Okay, all right, all right. 
The Dungeon Master's Guide contains, on page 13, mm -hmm. a table indicating that the human-like races in an AD&D game world grow and develop more or less in proportion to how long they live. Uh, I, I will share this chart with you, uh, with all of you listeners, uh, but it's, it's as you might imagine. Um, a century-old elf is equivalent to a human teenager, while a half-orc is full-grown well before 20 years of age and past the prime of life at 30. Combining this information with the with that on lifespans for the monster manual, the age categories data in the DMG can be expanded to include some of the humanoids. To some of the to include some of the humanoids. See the table below. Okay. Uh, so in the table below, you have bugbears, gnolls, goblins, hobgoblins, kobolds, ogres, and orcs, and all of their various young adult, mature, middle aged, old, and venerable. Ranges. Uh, the most. This extreme is very useful if you want to know when an ogre can start collecting social security checks. I suppose it, it is. Uh, the proportion of its life that each humanoid spends in the age categories given is based on the proportions given for a half orc. This should be about right for most of these humanoids, except in the case of kobolds. For reasons to be explained later, they probably reach the young adult stage much sooner than this table indicates. Leaving kobolds aside for the moment. <laughs> okay, look at I'm the glad we're putting those aside because <laughs> it's going to be too complicated otherwise. And here's some great insights from our interview with game designer Daniel Kwan. I could I could do this all day. I, 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 I get Honestly, worked, me too. <laughs> I, get, I get worked up about this because uh, Matt and I are always saying, like, we just want it to be better. Like, we, we want to play more interesting stories. We want yeah. to have better, like, representation of all people. We, you know, we, we like D&D. &D, we like playing in these settings. But, like, we just want them to be better. And so our criticism is meant from a place of love and like constructive um you know we were trying to improve the this thing yeah. that we spend it's, all of our time doing forward it's feed yeah. forward that's how you do it i mean like look i think all three of us and i've never I actually haven't said this on a podcast because i don't think anybody would really get it but like all three of us understand like the gaming industry and the pushback that we saw that is identical to academia oh yeah okay. well it's identical it has similar similar problems uh similar structures um you know a uh, small number of certain type of people in charge of everything in positions of power and positions of how uh, of power over how knowledge is basically constructed ooh well i like that daniel that's very smart um i uh <laughs> I, I hadn't i hadn't thought about it that way but uh as a yeah the academic nerd i really like that last but certainly not least here's an interview with the one and only keith baker and so you've come in just in time for Uprising Day, you know, <laughs> and and that the whole point of that is ultimately at the end of the day, we can make up history all we want. But what it comes down to is why is this going to be interesting for the story that you're going to tell? And then uh, you roll on that table, your your players come to that uh, village with the peasant uprising, and all of a sudden your game is now about overthrowing uh no sovereign hosts no dragon mark houses it's uh, absolutely a full peasant revolution in the and, wildlands between thrain and Ondare. yeah and yet of course that's my point i certainly have had that kind of thing happen uh more than Which, you know uh than once for sure uh <laughs> but that is what i love is that i thought this was going to be a murder mystery and it turns out that no it's a revolution and right. and i love yeah. that uh, this gets to be the game that we want it to be. I, I will say in the game I ran 56 times that I told you about, that is a murder mystery. And one of the things that happened there is the third time I ran it, we're about two thirds of the way through the game. The players say, okay, stop. And they lay out all the clues and they say, all right, it was Colonel Mustard. It's clear. <laughs> And it was not Colonel Mustard. It was Miss Scarlet. Uh, but the thing is, they had interpreted the clues in a completely logical way that I just hadn't mm. seen. I'm like, no, that, that totally makes sense. <laughs> and so as a game master, you're at that point of, well, I could just go ahead and it's Miss Scarlet. And they'll be like, huh, no, I didn't see it that way. I could try and re-push them the way I want them to go. But like I said, their logic makes sense. Or I can do what I did, which was like, yes, and when they pull the mask off, it's Colonel Mustard. And they're like, we are the best detectives ever. Uh, because, like I said, they worked on it. They made sense. It's just not the story I had seen. And that is what I love is I can make that change. I can make it. This is the movie the way 
uh, they want it to be. Whereas when I watch a TV mystery and I'm like, oh man, that doesn't make sense. It should have been that guy. I'm stuck with it. And so I do love that. If they want it to be a revolution, then okay, it's a revolution. That's it from us for year three. Thank you so much for your support, comrades. Stay safe and keep rolling those dice.